All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. And crown him, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Yes, I just want to sing amazing grace and sweet the sound that saved us all. To him, all majesty is crying. And crown him, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Yes, I just want to sing amazing grace and sweet the sound that saves us all. And I just want to sing amazing grace and sweet the sound that saves us all. yonder throne and we to at his feet may fall and join the everlasting song and crown him, crown him, crown him Lord of all as I just want to sing amazing good song sweet the sound that sang his song and I just want to sing Amazing grace and the sweet sound of Sammy's song. And I just want to sing Amazing grace and sweet sound and sing a song. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love, destined to die and poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned. And suffered as if he did All authority Every victory Is yours All authority Every victory Father's plan You're sending a sound A light in this broken land All authority Every victory Is yours All authority Every By 
the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome
Come thou found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. And I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home Now your grace is always with me And I'll never be alone So come now found, come now King Come now precious Prince of Peace Be your bride to you we sing Come now found of our blessing Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace, feel your bride to you is sing, come thou found a barbas. Greater debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Precious Prince of Peace, hear your bride to you is sing. Come thou found of our blessing. Come thou found, oh come thou King. Come thou precious Prince of Peace, hear your bride to you is sing. Come thou found of our blessing. This week we'll, we'll continue in Genesis and we'll be we'll start in Genesis chapter 42. And last week I said that we would wrap up Genesis. This week was, can I see the hands of anyone who believed me? <laughs> We're not going to get through it this week. I, I, I always have big eyes, I guess. And, uh, but if, as, as we start, I, I, I want to say to uh, our friends in Uganda and South Sudan who, who are receiving these messages that we're, go, we're going to be talking today about drought and famine. And as I, as I put these notes together, my, my thoughts are with you because I know your countries are, are facing both those things today, that, that you've suffered drought and, and maybe continue to do so, and, and famine and, and great difficulty. So I know uh, the subject matter is near and dear to you, and, and we will continue to uh, pray for the situation in your countries. Uh, I hope that you know God is sovereign and, and he knows the situation and he rules over the situations and, and as we see in these studies, sometimes these difficult situations are, are for a bigger purpose of his and, and I trust that the same is true in your situation. Uh, so this is lesson Genesis, I call it Genesis lesson Z, so it means we've been here for 26 weeks and I think I think in 27 weeks we'll wrap up Genesis. I think there's one more, but I keep thinking that. <coughs> so today as we get, get nearer to the conclusion of, of Genesis and, and the final, uh, really about the final third of the book deals with the life, life of Joseph. 
So I think it's important that we have this understanding of why Joseph. What's the what's the big picture? Well, we, we've seen that thus far because of the fall of man, that there early in Genesis that God promised that a savior would come of the seed of woman. And from that very promise, from that very point, that, that what we've been looking at, Satan began to work on humanity. He began his efforts to see that the human line, the human sea was so corrupted that Christ, our kinsman and redeemer, could not come. you got to understand that Satan's future depended upon <coughs> his ability to corrupt humanity. His future depended on it. If he could stop Jesus Christ, he'd have a future. But So that's what he was up to. But God stopped that, that first attempt. He stopped that first tactic of, by way to flood. By way to flood of Noah, as we know it, God preserved a pure seed, at, at least in, through Noah and, and his son Shem. So we know that once humanity left the ark, they began to reproduce and disperse and at the same time we know that the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ began shepherding the line of Noah's son Shem through history we, we know that through that shepherding that Jesus caused the Hebrew people that come from that line of Shem become a clannish group that was resistant to intermarrying with other groups you see God had verbalized promises, his covenant promises to Abraham. He promised through Abraham that all nations of the world would be blessed through his offspring. And we're seeing that those, those covenant promises have passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and, and now to Judah through which Jesus would come. And at Jacob, even though the playing field got much broader, you know, it had been pretty narrow, but with, with Judah... I'm sorry, with, with Jacob having 12 sons, uh, it began confusing things for Satan. You know, it, was, it was pretty easy to follow when it was just a narrow family. But, but Jacob had 12 sons, and, and God, a big family, and God was about to propel the Hebrew people, this narrow line, this, at this time, a, a family of 70 people, into a, becoming a nation of a couple million people. So how, how confusing does it get for Satan to stop Jesus when he's now got, well, we'll soon have two million people to deal with. And God was not only going to grow them into a nation of two million people, he's going to grow them into a nation even of wealth. He's going to make a great nation, of, just as he promised to Abraham. So how is he going to do that? Well, if you think of the Hebrew family, the, this little family of, that come through Abraham that uh, rest at this point was, with Jacob and 70 people, if you think of that as a nucleus or an egg, well, we, we all know that if you wanted, if you had an egg and you wanted to incubate it, you have to have an incubator. But well, God used Egypt as that incubator in which the nation of Israel would grow from the Hebrew family. So what we have in this story of Joseph is we have the story of how God moved Israel the Hebrew family into the incubators, about moving them into the incubator. How he moved this distinctly Hebrew family to Egypt, out of the promised land. You know, he promised them this land, and now he's going to move them to another land. This is a story about how God moved these people to, to Egypt where they would flourish, and not only flourish, but see, he's got to maintain their genetic purity, their genetic identity. So we, we know that how this has come about is Jacob's son Joseph was betrayed by his brother as he sold into slavery. He ended up in prison due to a false accusation of rape made against him. And we've read that eventually there in prison because of some divine appointments that Joseph ran into a couple of guys who were also in prison, a baker and a butler of the Pharaoh, and he correctly interpret their, their dreams. And those interpretations opened the door for Joseph to take a, have a shot at interpreting a dream of Pharaoh himself, which he did correctly. So it was, what we see is it was through this string of events that God 
arranged for a favored son of Jacob, believed by his father to be dead, to become the primary active governing official of Egypt. This is a major string of events to get this man to this position. Amazing string of, of events that led to, in a single day, Joseph moving from prisoner to prime minister, if you want to think of it that way, of Egypt. Well, as we've seen, eventually as time passed, and because of the interpretation, Joseph found himself sitting in authority, sitting over these massive stores of grain in Egypt when the entire region came under a severe drought. And what accompanies a multi-year drought, but famine always comes as part of drought. As chapter 41 closed, we learned that Pharaoh had given Joseph an Egyptian wife uh, and who bore him two half-breed sons named Manasseh and Ephraim. So that brings us into chapter 42. This famine was severe. It wasn't just an Egyptian famine. It was a famine of a broad area in the Middle East. Family was even in the promised land of Canaan. As, as the chapter opens, chapter 42, you read that one day Jacob says to his sons, and I would say all except for his youngest son, Benjamin, whose name means son of my right hand, who he intends to keep with him, is Benjamin is the only connection he has remaining to his, his favored wife, Rachel. He says to his sons, Stop looking at each other and do something. That's basically what it says. You know, uh, any of you from Akron knew, knew Mr. Matthias. He has said, quit sitting there with your teeth in your mouth and do something. That makes me think of that. It makes me think of him when I read this. Jim's an Akron guy. He, he, he knows. So what says 42.1, why do you look upon one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard there is corn in Egypt. Get you down tether and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And that's a pretty human verse. It's a verse you can, you can sense some tension. You can sense some impatience on the, on the part of Jacob. You may even be hearing of a, from a man who feels like he's come to the end of himself. He's an old man now, and, and his family's come, and he's feeling helpless, and He's got these, all these boys, and they're just sitting around, nobody's doing anything. Nobody's doing anything to figure out a way out of this situation. They're sitting there looking at each other. They're just waiting to die, basically. So, so Jacob sends his sons, just like everyone else, I'm sure, in the area, in the region, was doing to Egypt to buy food. And on this trip, they had no idea that they were about to meet their brother that they had betrayed some 20 years earlier. When they arrived there, <coughs> when they got into Egypt, they met, the, they met this Egyptian authority, this one who sat over the stores of grain, and they bowed himself down to them, to him. It's Joseph. They had no idea that this is their brother. I had no idea. And do you remember the first dream that Joseph had that we looked at? Here it is in its fulfillment. It, it was back in Genesis 37, 7. It said this. It said, for behold, this is a dream of Joseph. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall thou indeed reign over us? So you, shall you have dominion over us? And they hated him more for his dreams and his words. This is the fulfillment of But they didn't recognize him. And Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers betrayed him, and now he was nearly 40 years old. And they coming into Egypt would have never dreamed it possible that they would be encountering this brother that they betrayed. Never dreamed it possible that Joseph would be some high-ranking Egyptian official arraigned in fine linen. Never dreamed it possible. I doubt if they even make eye contact with this great, powerful authority as they bowed before him. They didn't recognize him. But Joseph recognized them. It says he not only recognized them, he remembered that dream. He remembered that dream he had. 
You ever have those situations where something happens and you have to react just like that? And you look back upon it and you think, man, if, if I had time to think, I would have reacted differently. I think, this, I think this meeting is one of those times for Joseph. He had no expectations of seeing his brothers just as they didn't expect to see him. And so he's, he's attending to Pharaoh's business. People are coming. I imagine in his lines of people coming to buy food to survive this famine. And, and one day he has his brothers bowing down before him. He remembers his dream. He's got to react somehow. Oh, put yourself in that situation. I, 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 these are the ones who betrayed you. These are the ones who left you for dead. How do you react? This is a confusing situation. I, th I think he did the best he could, did. He, he, he didn't want them to recognize who he was. So he puts them on their hills. He accused them of being spies. He says, surely, surely you're spies. It was brother and sister to Joseph that they're not spies. That, uh, they're, they're but ten brothers who have come only to buy grain. And, and they, they share that they're of a family of twelve brothers one of which no longer is, speaking of him, and one of which the youngest stayed behind with their father. But Joseph told him that the only way that he was going to believe that they weren't spies, in fact, the only way that he would spare their lives because he thought they were spies, is if one of them would return home and, and bring their youngest brother to him. So he's thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking. Well, you know, Benjamin, remember, Benjamin is his only full-blooded brother. The rest have, all have different mothers, and, and he has a desire. He knows he wants to see Benjamin. So he, he puts all, all of his ten brothers into prison. <coughs> I, wonder, I wonder, you know, we read this. It's a simple, fairly simple story, but there has to be so much emotion, so much complexity underneath this. As he prays, you know, back then a, a prison was basically a pit, a dungeon, I wonder if Joseph had some kind of satisfaction by letting his brothers sit in that pit and worry just as they had placed him in a pit and let him worry all those years ago. Scripture says he left them there for three days. And I can only imagine the mental gymnastics that Joseph must have put himself through during those three days. What should I do? These are my brothers. What should I do? It's, it had to put him on his heels too. How can I possibly forgive these people who betrayed me? These are the same brothers that before they betrayed him, remember they hated him. They wouldn't have a conversation. They excluded him. They probably tripping him, giving him elbows, disrespecting him in every way. How can I forgive these brothers of mine, but how Am I so tormented? How can I still have such love for them? How can I have these mixed emotions for these people who betrayed me? I can't imagine the mental gymnastics he went through for three days. It says, the scripture says at the end of three days, because of concern for his father and his family who were still at home starving to death, Joseph came to a, a better decision. He changed his mind. So, you know, he's, he, he now becomes the task-oriented guy he, he was. The problem is my family's at home starving. How do I get grain to them quickly? I'm not going to do that by having all these nine in, in prison and sending one. I'm going to reverse my decision. I'm going to keep one. I'm going to send nine. I'm going to send them with grain to my father and my, the rest of my family. So he kept only Simeon. His next to the oldest brother, he kept on him confined in prison and sent the rest. Now, it's interesting. Uh, you know, Joseph had been in Egypt for a lot of years. He had this position. He's not speaking Hebrew. He's speaking Egyptian. He still, still has his Hebrew. He, all this speaking he'd been doing to his brothers through an interpreter. So they, had no, they didn't know who he was. They had no idea that he could speak Hebrew. And I don't know if you've been in these situations. I've been in these situations. I've been, uh, Don and I were recently in Mexico, and you're in, in a car with people who speak another language, and, and half the time they're talking to each other, and you're, you're, 
you're thinking, are, are they saying I got, you know, a hair grown out of my forehead? Are they, are they saying I'm, let's, let's club them in the head and steal their money? You, you don't know what's going on. This, this is the same thing that's happening. Is, uh, these brothers begin speaking to each other in Hebrew, assuming that, that this official can't understand them. And they're having a private, con- what they think is a private conversation in Genesis 42, 21. It says, and they said to one another, well, they're, they're, they're wringing their hands and they're fretting over the situation they found themselves in. Guilt is starting to, to bear down on them. They said to one another, we're very guilty concerning our brother. They're remembering, they're talking about Joseph. He's standing right there and they're talking about what they'd done to him all those years earlier. We're guilty because we saw the anguish of his soul. He besought us or, or he was begging us and we wouldn't even hear Remember, he was in the pit, and I told you, I think they moved a ways off, and they had a fire that night. They moved far enough where they could quit hearing the aggravating crying and begging. We would not even hear. That's why this distress, this is why this situation has come upon us. And Reuben answered him, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against a child, and yet you wouldn't listen. Therefore, his blood is being required on us. You know, in Sunday school, we're, we're studying Job, and the thought is that Job's problems was because of what Job had done, that, that there's a balance. And as, as we do evil, that God gives us evil. And, it's, and that's the same thought they have here is, you know, we remember this great, we have this great guilt. We remember what we did to our own brother, how we betrayed him. And it's because of that that we're in this situation today. Not true. Just as, just as Job's situation was, you know, under a bigger plan of God, as we read it here, here in Genesis, we're, we're seeing the bigger plan of God. That these boys were going, these young men were going through this situation because God had this big plan to get this family into the Egyptian incubator. This is why they were going through this. So Joseph locked up, as I said, only Simeon and sent the other brothers back home with their sacks filled with grain. They came with sacks to carry grain. And he sent them, He had the sacks filled up and he had his officials to put the money that they brought to buy grain in the, in the mouths or in the top of the sack. And, and scripture says that as, as they were gone, as they left, Joseph privately wept. Again, this is, this is an emotional event. And I, I read that and I think about Jesus. You know, I've been telling you, Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I read that he privately wept. I think about Jesus when he encountered the people, his own, his own people who didn't recognize him. You probably remember that event. It was Palm Sunday, and the people thought that they had in their midst a military commander. In Luke 19.41, it says, and he, when he was come near, remember, this is the Palm Sunday parade. They thought he was someone he wasn't. It says, and when he come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. That was in the middle of a throng of people. But I think he privately wept. Everyone's so busy celebrating the one who would overthrow the Romans that they didn't even, I don't think, notice. So the brothers have, have these grain, these bags of grain and their money, and they return home, and they, they, they have to have to meet Jacob, have to meet dear old dad. You know, they got green. But there's, but there's a catch. So here, well, here's, here's the food you sent us for, but bad news is we had to leave Simeon behind. He's, he's being held in prison. And there's, uh, there's another catch. The only way we can get them out, the only way we can buy more food is if we take Benjamin back with us. It says that basically Jacob went hysterical. He went hysterical. I've already lost one son. Speaking of Joseph, I've got another one. You're telling me I've got another one rotting in jail, and you want me to entrust my youngest son to you to go back to that place? He refused. He wouldn't. He wouldn't let Benjamin go. And it takes us into chapter forty-three, and you know, I, it doesn't say how much time has passed, but some time has passed. They came back with a 
limited amount of grain and this this drought a drought and famine doesn't doesn't end immediately and and we know by pharaoh's dream this is going to be a seven-year drought so the drought continues and so, some time passes and, and the family had consumed or nearing the end of the grain that the boys had brought back from Egypt and the drought continues and it comes to the point that Jacob had no choice but to finally relent and tell the tell them that they could they could go back they need to go back to Egypt and at, at first he, he suggested that the ten just go and the boys protested no, there's no way there's, we're not going back here unless we take little Benny with us It'll be our undoing if we do. And then Jake, there's some blaming. You know, we're always good at blaming. Jacob blames. He he says he wrestles with this. He does some blaming. He's basically says, "I, don't, I <laughs> you went to Egypt just to buy grain. I don't even understand why you even mentioned Benjamin while you're there. Why you even? Why did you even tell the Egyptians you had a younger brother? If you kept your mouth shut, we wouldn't have this problem. Well, that's true a lot for us, isn't it? If you keep your mouth shut, we don't have no problems. It's your fault. You could have spared me the situation. What, before you went, you were just standing here with your teeth in your mouth, looking at each other, doing nothing? I seen you eat it, you could succumb this? Good grief. That's how I would react. And that's when Judah, the, Judah brings some logic into the situation. You begin to see how Judah is becoming the leader of the family. Basically, Judah says, look, Let's, let's, let's look logically at our situation. If we don't take Benjamin and go back, you're going to watch him die anyway. Matter of fact, we're all going to sit here and watch each other die. So Jacob finally submits to the inevitable. He says, if I grieve, I grieve. He allows Benjamin to go back to Egypt with, with the other brothers. And when they arrived in Egypt, Joseph kept his word and he re released Simon. And then, and then he dines with them. He, he Brings them in, and he's going to dine with them. And, and Scripture says that he, he was so overcome by seeing Benjamin that he went in another room privately and, and wept. Uh, and, and it's right here in, in this event that, that we get a uh, glimpse of why Egypt. Why would God want his Hebrew people to be in the incubator of Egypt? Even though we know that they're going to be, and it's already been prophesied, that they'd be enslaved for near 400 years. Why would it benefit or why would, how would it propel the pure human bloodline of the Hebrew people toward Jesus Christ by their being in Egypt? And you find it here in, in 33, 32. Speaking of this, of this mill, it says, And they set on him, set on or, or set the table for him by himself, for Joseph, and for them, by themselves, his brothers, and for the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves. So, so you got three tables, three separate tables here. And here's, here's why Egypt. Because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. This is how the bloodline is going to be kept pure. This is why Egypt was the perfect incubator in which God would grow this human or this Hebrew nation. Because my gosh, the Egyptians wouldn't even sit and eat at the same table with them. Much less did they want to marry or interbreed because the Egyptians were a clean people. They viewed themselves as being very clean and, and they viewed these Hebrew people as being something less. So this is why Egypt. In chapter 44, it says that, that uh, the next day that Joseph had his brothers, this time they brought, you know, they were really worried the first time they found their money in the bags. So, so they, they brought the first money back with them again, wanting to make things right in case that was known. So they brought double money. Uh, so their double money is put in their bags, filled with grain again. This time Joseph has his servant hide his favorite silver cup in Benjamin's bag. 
it gives him time to depart for home, and he sends his guards to catch up with him and, and accuse him of stealing his cup. Well, it seems like you know the brothers were pleading the innocence and probably offended by the accusations. Like we, you know, we didn't come for trouble; we just come from, for some food. So they basically say, search our stuff, and if you find a cup in anyone's bag, you you can rightfully kill that person. And this reminds you, should remind you of uh, when Laban was was chasing chasing after Jacob when Jacob and Rachel had left and Leah, and remember Rachel had unknowingly stole the family idols and caught up, and that was the same thing Jacob had said, which I... By the way, I think it did cost him Rachel earlier than she would have went, where she, not that long after, passed away. So they they begin opening these, these bags, and I, the brothers were terrified as they find that their money again is in their sacks. It's like, you know, we're not stealing our money. We're I, we don't understand how our money is in our sacks, but but then imagine their terror when. This cup is pulled out of Benjamin's sack, Joseph's cup. So they're taken back to, back to Egypt, back before Joseph, and it says that you know they're, when they're presented to Joseph as thieves, basically that they throw themselves on his mercy. Again, that's, he's a, Joseph is a type of Jesus. That one day every person will be brought before him for judgment and mercy, or desired mercy. Our desire, our, our greatest desire is, should be that we could be but a servant of Jesus. If we could just be but a servant of Jesus. If you remember the story of the prodigal son, when, when he was, wanted to finally come home, what was his great desire? If I could just be your servant. And what did he get? What did the father give him? Remember? He gave him so much more, and that's what Jesus has for us. We should... We should come with that attitude that we would be so happy just to be your servant. But but Jesus has so much more for us. If we return to if we come to him in repentance, that's what the prodigal son did. He came in repentance of what he'd done. Judah said, What what, what can we say? Again, Judah's becoming a family leader. What can we say? Uh, there's no way for us to defend ourselves. He told Joseph, we're, we're being paid for what we did to our brother. We're being paid for our past sins. Just allow us to be your servants. We're, we're defenseless. And that's the way we sh- we'll stand before Jesus Christ on our own. Defenseless. But for his mercy. But Joseph, Joseph said, that's not what I'm going to do. The one who had the cup will be my servant. The rest of you can go home. Now, Judah, before they left, had, had promised to his dad that he would bring Benjamin back. Judah personally made that promise. In Genesis 44, 33, Judah said, Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my, to my Lord, and let the lad go with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad not be with me? He's saying, I promised my dad I would bring Benjamin back. How can I possibly go? Because if I go without Benjamin, I'm going to see what's going to happen to my dad, and it's not going to be good, and I don't want to see it. I'd rather stay here and be a servant to you. Please just keep me as your servant and let him go. So he's begging Joseph to make him a slave and let Benjamin go home thinking that better than disappointing his dad. In chapter 45, uh, remember Joseph Erler had been, had been hearing his brothers argue with each other, uh, regretting what they had done to him all those years earlier. Remember, they don't know that he can understand Hebrew. Chapter 45, now he's witnessing their loyalty to their father. As, as they converse with each other, you know, wanting to enslave themselves and get Benjamin home, he's, he's witnessing the extent that they will go to sacrifice themselves to honor their father. 
And it was finally morning he could take. In 45, chapter, or chapter 45, verse 1, it says, Then Joseph couldn't refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried. Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Remember I told you a week or so ago, he was beginning to see why, why he had went through all these events. Verse 6, for these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five remaining, in which there shall never, neither be hearing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he has made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler through all of Egypt. Haste ye and go up to my father and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children, thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there I will nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaks unto you. And ye shall tell my father all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye have seen and ye shall haste and bring down my father tither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Now can you imagine the shock and the fear and these brothers of Joseph as they find out that who this is that they're dealing with. Can you imagine their fear when they figure out this is the brother who they had betrayed, who they had so mistreated, who they had hated? Can you imagine their fear as they figured out that their fate was in his hands and his hands alone? And again, as I was telling you last week, Joseph is seeing God's plan. He's seeing how his situation, all, although it, in many turns was hard, he sees that God was working something out. He sees that all the trials that he has suffered were necessary for God to position his family for life, for survival. Now again, it's a foreshadowing. This, just as these brothers were no doubt terrified when they realized that their fate was in the hands of the one they had betrayed, I'll tell you there are countless people on the face of the earth today who are going to come to the same situation where they're going to stand in front of Jesus Christ who they have denied and betrayed and realize that their eternity is in his hands and his alone. And they are going to know fear. But theirs will be a different situation than this because at the great white throne judgment, unrepentant sinners are going to know that God's mercy has been exhausted for them. And if Jesus Christ is just which he is, there is only one answer for them. It's the lake of fire. Can you imagine the fear that people will realize that, that day? as every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, that the one who I have denied and betrayed is Lord, that he does hold my fate in his hands. And what an astonishing reunion we read about between Joseph and his brothers. He instructed them to go back to Canaan and get the rest of the family. He instructed them to go back with the message that Joseph is not only alive, but he's a great authority in Egypt. He's in charge, and you should plan to come and move to Egypt and live near him. Don't even bother packing up your stuff because you'll be provided for.
Again, there's a message hiding in this story if you'll see it. Quit worrying so much about your stuff. Just come to Jesus and trust in him. That stuff you knock yourself out for is going to do nothing for you in the face of eternity. John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Provision. Don't worry so much about your stuff. You're not bringing it with you. <clears throat> Don't let it keep you away. Well, Jacob could have done that. His boys could have went home and they said, Dad, Joseph's alive. We need to move to Egypt. And Joseph could have said, I can't, I can't leave my stuff. I can't see any way I'm going to pick up and leave everything I worked so hard for. Genesis 45, 24 says, So he sent his brethren away. They departed. And he said unto them, See that ye not fall out by the way. Go straight there. They went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan and to Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed him not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said to them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Can you imagine this news? Can you imagine Jacob getting this news? Can you imagine the Can you imagine the feeling of these brothers? Can you imagine the joy they have at bringing this news to their father? Can you imagine the dread they have of the truth coming out? Because right behind their father finding out that Joseph still lives, somewhere comes out the truth of how Joseph disappeared. I can't, I can't imagine Joseph's situation. How do you swallow this? I mean, sorry, Jacob's situation. How do you swallow this news? You know, my own son has been gone for 15 years, and I'm sure, but just as he was sure that Joseph had been gone. If someone came to me today and said that your son is alive and well, I don't, I can't fathom how I could wrap my mind around that. And this is what his position was. For 20 years, he believed that Joseph was dead. And here he is in the midst of this famine, in the midst of his fear for Benjamin and Simeon, who's in prison, and all these boys, and they, they finally return. He's happy to return, and they said, guess what? Joseph is alive. How do you wrap your mind around that? Again, a foreshadow of Jesus Christ who was once dead but lived again. And Jacob's asked to pick up and move and just leave everything and walk into a new life. You know, he, he heard the message. Again, it's a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing of the gospel. He heard the message and he saw the evidence and, and the evidence in the wagons. But he had to move in faith. He had to move toward one who was once dead or once thought dead and yet lived and he couldn't see. See, so he had to move towards him in faith that this message was true. I don't see Joseph staying out there at the wagon, but I hear the message, I see evidence, and I, in faith I'm going to move to Egypt. It's the same place we are. We have a Savior. We have the gospel message. We have a Savior we cannot yet see. And we, we, we look for evidence, and we see some evidence. We see some evidence manifested in miracles. And we move towards him. We move towards Jesus Christ. We move towards something in the future that is unbelievable. In the natural world, unbelievable, but believable to us because we're born again and we're spiritual creatures. 
yet we still move in faith, faith alone. We move in faith alone to something we cannot yet see. And I am done, and Jim, because we're off our rockers this week, we didn't pick out a final song, did we? Did you? You give it to me? I didn't open it. I didn't open it. Then, I, then it's all me. So we don't have a final song, which is fine. So let's let's just pray, and we'll just end there. I dare Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for your your word and scripture. I thank you for the lessons that you uh, give us and the foreshadowing that Joseph made in his life of Jesus Christ and our ability to see him. Father, as uh, we walk ever near you, I know that you continue to press closer and closer to us. So, Father, walk with us this week. Be nursing your Holy Spirit. Guide each and every one of us. Uh, help us to live this week as you would have us to live. In Jesus' name.